everyone, it's your favourite Atomic Blonde here with this week's Roundup. <sighs> Guys. This show is killing me. <laughs> She-Hulk, holy hell. That's like, anybody. So, in this side-splitting, rib-tickling episode this week, holy hell, when I finished watching it, I was I literally put a tweet out, and it was just like, what the fuck? have I just watched <laughs> I, I just I don't have I just don't know what this show is about there's still no plot there's still no story arc it's just random cringy things happening and this week is the infamous tinder episode which was just so bad um okay let's go from the top and get through this as quickly as possible <laughs> So we start off in a theatre. There's a <clears throat> magician show happening. It's like an old, old decrepit theatre. There's hardly anybody in there. There's a magician on stage. Um, here we find out he's called, I think it's Donnie Blaze. Donnie, Donnie Blaze, I think. <laughs> Whatever. Um, and he's performing some tricks and they're awful. Um, there's hardly anybody in the audience. When he's finished the trick, you just kind of get the slow clap you know it's, so it's going down down as well as the actual show itself so <laughs> a bit meta there from the writers well done not intentional i'm sure um so anyway yeah the, the the then we see off um in the wings the the owner of the, of the theater who basically looks like discount morgan freeman so we're calling discount morgan freeman from now um basically says like do the thing do the thing and he's like i can't and he's like do the thing and we basically see the this this donny dude um pull out a sling ring and open a portal he brings a girl up on stage and this is when we're introduced to madison <sighs> holy hell who's basically some valley party girl like oh my god oh my god these that smelled awful and oh, i'm sticking to the floor and oh my god so it was dude yeah it's like oh my god i wish someone would just kill me um so there's madison she ends up going through the portal into another dimension we then see her the portal opening and we, and we go to wong um, he's back in the pool in Kathmandu, wherever he is. And he's, and again, as I said last week, the writers have done, the, this is actually the only level of consistency we have in the show that yet again they've managed to reduce Wong's um, IQ by another 10 points to make him look even dumber than he was last week. So, uh, well done. Um, yeah, so he's basically sitting there. Bear in mind, he's the Sorcerer Supreme. He used to own, you know, look after the libraries of all these amazing books but now he just sits there watching but we assume it's like netflix or something and he's sitting there settling down to watch the sopranos good choice fair enough but you know he's sitting there to watch sopranos so this madison turns up still with a part in her hand and still pissed god knows how um basically explains that this donny guy put her in a dimension and she had to find my way out and with the with goats and blood and ugh, you know so um he gets all annoyed um and um we cut to like jen and again yet another cringe like sort of saying hey so we had wong last week so that's twitter armor for another week because you're all like wong right and it's like well we did until your writers got your hands on him and made him a complete knob but anyway so then we cut to jen in the office and wong turning up saying he wants her help uh it transpires that this donny guy was a um apprentice at, at the um, uh, at the the Carmitage, I think it's called, you know, the Doctor Strange place, and um, uh, but he couldn't cut it; he was just useless. So he was released from the program, um, and now he just does like say he's a magician. Um, and he basically one wants to cease and desist on him. Um, Jen agrees to this. Uh, that means obviously they've got to go to court. 
Um, so, which they do end up going to court. Um, but again, you know, I don't know if the shows are being sh shown out of order or the writers are just stupid and don't care, probably the latter. So bear in mind that last week at the end, we found out now Wong's obviously um, committed a federal crime in the police bathroom for breaking out the abomination. Everybody seems to have forgotten about this this week when he turns up to see Jen and then she basically takes him into a court so they can have a cease and desist put on. All that's completely ignored, but but hey, why, why worry about trivial plot details or continuity? That happens a bit further on. Um, so anyway, we've got to that point. So yeah, Jen's agreed to help him with that. And then cuts to Jen and her annoying paralegal friend who doesn't seem to do any work. She's just always on the social medias, whatever. Um, and they're talking about Jen's Tinder profile and she's on there and she matched and Jen's just trying to ignore it because, you know, she, she doesn't need a man. Um, so anyway, this poor, this dude comes over um, and sort of speaks to them. And uh, I, I can only conclude that the writers of this show have either never been chatted up in their lives, hence why they're so like bitter and twisted towards men, or they've not been chatted up since like 1999 or something. I, I don't know. But basically this guy's like, hey, sexy ladies, can I buy you a drink, sexy ladies? Hate to see you on your own here, sexy ladies. And then you get her oh, paralegal pip up. Well, there's two of us, so clearly we're not on our own. And you're like, oh, Jesus Christ. So we're really like, Ugh. and then Jay's like, can't you see that we're busy, you know? pushing down her anger and he's just oh I just wanted to buy you a drink and like you know he wasn't like being massively offensive probably a little bit irritating but the writing the dialogue is just men don't talk like that and no human being talks like that it's just oh whatever's right so anyway they send him off with a flea in his ear they're talking about her blooming tinder profile um and um <clears throat> so then we go to like the Jen going to the, the theatre club weird Wong to serve this cease and desist to discount Morgan Freeman and uh, Donnie and they kind of get into this sort of tip for tap thing and magic's real and not real and let's all do some tricks and stuff and it's all just a bit cringe so anyway she sort of hands over the paperwork and it's like see you in court um so then uh Jen's at home on a Friday night working and she finds a uh, paralegal who never does any work who is clearly not doing any work uh and she's out and she, and she asks for something and she's like but saturday tomorrow we've gone it's saturday and she's like oh my god are you in your pajamas already and jenny's obviously in her pajamas because she has no life um she's like, oh no 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 you're yet um and then she's uh checking her phone and she's got no matches so then she decides to set a profile up as she hulk and she's all like yeah i know oh, terrible and of course, as soon as she set up a profile, it pings and she has like 300 matches or something, I don't know. Um, so then the next thing we see is like Jen on a date. Bearing in mind, she's just literally matched to these guys and it's Friday night. So why these guys would be free, I don't know. And then she basically has like sort of five dates all on the same night. So if she basically gone to like speed dating, I'd get it. But she's basically set up these five dates or I don't know, what, an hour apart or something. Like, who knows? So what would have happened if she'd actually really liked the first guy that she met? What would she have done with the other four? Oh, God. Yeah, logic has no bearing in this this, <laughs> this show. So anyway, of course, all the men turn up are uh, idiots and dicks. And, you know, one refers to her as a easy, especially the geek of the bunch. And... Um, First was a specimen. So you don't know if he's just actually a geek and, a, you know, completely inept at dating or this is linked to last week and they're trying to work out how to get blood sample because he was asking about the metal that the Captain America shields made off and whether that would pierce her skin. So could be that because the clever just trying to be super clever, trying to get it past us. But anyway, the other men are just like, you know, like too aggressive, too aggro. And, um, oh, she had been out on a date as, as Jen and the, the guy she went out with was all about him. And then as soon as he asked her about her and she starts talking about her, he looks at his phone, he's looking at other women, he's not paying attention. Then the date's over, the bill comes out and this whole stupid like sort of Mexican standoff thing, who's going to pay for the bill? Um, and he basically just gets up and links her with the bill, which she's agreed about, but then they're all supposed to be feminists, so surely... They'd be they they'd want to pay the bill at least. Uh, 
who knows there's just say like, no bloody logic so anyway on this like fifth day this guy sits down and she asks him what he does and he says he's a doctor so of course she just insults him and says oh is that slang for selling opioids or something and he goes, no, I'm a real doctor. He's a pediatrician, if I can say the word. Um, and then all of a sudden she's interested because, you know, not shallow at all. Um, and, um, yeah, so she sort of asks him a couple of things and he's all like, um, oh, I don't like talking about me. I want to hear about you. And she basically pulls his face like she's just coming in her knickers. And you're just like, it's just so like, it's like, all right, love. Like, no man's ever listened to you ever. I mean, Jesus Christ, where have you been living? Um, so anyway, she starts gushing about herself, um, and uh, every time he says something, she just seems to sort of come in her knickers again. It's all a bit gross. Um, so they end up basically back at she hulk Jen's place, and they're sitting on the sofa, and um, yeah, she's there. There's all sort of bit of flirting, and then she just goes in to, to like lay one on him and knocks one down him but I think she just leans in and goes to kiss him now you know in in the modern world we hear all the time you know so she just can you know just doesn't ask permission basically just goes straight in there but then knocks wine down him so he then like goes oh no son's gone on the sofa so he goes off to get a cloth to, to clean it all up and basically takes his, his jumper off he's got like a vest top on underneath and then Jen basically takes his jumper and chucks it on the floor so he can't put his shirt back on now, if this is the other way around and Jen had a blouse and she took her blouse off and the guy chucked it somewhere so she couldn't put her blouse back on and she was just like in a cami or something, I, you know, the, the, the <laughs> Twitter would be going mental. So anyway, they're in this day and um, while all this is going on, um, basically at the court hearing, uh, I think there's going to be a follow-up hearing or something and... Um, they basically agreed that Donnie could carry on practicing mag magic until this hearing or whatnot. Oh, who, who cares? Um, so, yeah, so Donnie's doing another show, opens a portal. This time he opens it to like some sort of demon realm and all these demons start coming out. So he then goes to Wong for help. And then Wong obviously has the whole of the Avengers on speed dial and he is a source of supreme, but chooses to get Jen's help. So he opens a portal, um, you know, Jen's uh, like trying to put her moves on the, the dude again. Um, and Wong's like, right, you got to come and help me. Yeah, there's all these demons. And she's like, well, what do you want me to do? And he goes, well, I want you to be a Hulk. So off she pops with Wong. Um, and this is a completely pointless scene. So initially she's sort of catching them one at a time and chucking them through and Wong's lassoing some. And then there's a conversation going on that I can't even remember what it was about. It was so pointless. Um, and then basically at the end, like, Wong just sort of does this, creates a tornado and sucks them all through. So he didn't need Jen there at all anyway. Like I said, completely pointless. Whatever. So then Jen goes back, she drops through the portal and lands on top of the doctor basically he's laying on the sofa and she lands on top of him straddling him talk about invading invading your space right doesn't make any effort to get off him or apologize she's just like there in his face like giving him the lust eyes and he's sitting there reading some bloody feminist novel and you're like that would be like an instant turn off would it but anyway so she sort of you know, chucks the book to one side basically like you say invades his space just picks him up and takes him off to the bedroom like <laughs> no consent no may i take you to the bedroom nothing so we you know so we have no idea what's going on whether it's consensual or not but it doesn't matter right because he's just a man okay just roll um um Oh, yeah, but basically with the, getting old demons, she basically scares Donnie into the cease and desist. So that storyline's ended, seeing he's got back. Um, oh, and the annoying Madison turned up, but it's basically um, to help support uh, Wong at the thing. And uh, and she suddenly started calling him Wongers, so he's Wongers now. Again, it's all just really degrading. So anyway, um, it's then the next morning, and Jen's up, and she's watching the TV, and she's Jen, and then the guy comes out of the bedroom, sort of says, uh, who are you? And she goes, oh, it's me, me, Jen. And he's like, Phew. he's like, no, Jen, she hold Jen. And he's like, really like not, he's like kind of mortified going, 
Well, so basically, you know, he's like, I've been catfished. I mean, he doesn't say it, but that's basically what happened. You know, she he goes on a date with, he matches with one person, goes on a date, sleeps with her, supposedly, we guess, or great, who knows. Um, and then <laughs> she's not a She-Hulk anymore. So he kind of gives her the cold shoulder and is like, yeah, all right, see you later. And then she's like really aggrieved. <laughs> so she's like forced herself on this guy, catfished him, and now she's like the victim in this whole situation. I just, I, I'm i just at a loss. <laughs> I really am. So anyway, he leaves. There's a knock on the door. It's the postman or something. And um, he hands her a form basically saying that she's being sued. And she's being sued by um, t t Titania, I think her name is. Uh, oh, J J Jamila, upper self Jamil. Um, yeah, for uh, breach of trademark, because she's trademarked the word she hulk so now she's got to go fight to get her name who cares i mean <laughs> this whole episode was just so pointless and this introduction of madison valley girl who's just always partying always drunk and starts calling wong wongers and they sit and watch sopranos together but all she does is keep giving away spoilers how I don't know how that's supposed to be funny or how that's an addition to the cast that we go, hey, can't wait to see Madison next week. <sighs> I'm like, oh, I had <laughs> honestly, people, I, I don't know how I'm going to make it to nine episodes. <laughs> I, 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 I need I need a sip. Um, this show is utter garbage. The constant male bashing and the twisted morals and it's okay to, you know, belittle and force yourself on a man. It's just it's utter, utter. So anyway, tune in next week to find out what nonsense we're up to on She-Hulk. Oh, it's, um, yeah, any, just, oh, just, oh. So, thank God, I can now talk about something that's good. House of the Dragon, episode three. Um, so, as you can tell from that intro, I'm really enjoying this show. Um, I th the previous two weeks, you know, I have talked about some some pacing issues, but uh, there was not for me. There was none of this in episode three. Um, pardon me. Um, there's um. A time jump again uh we sort of moved on a couple of years and again it's just done you know it's done with um the, the the king's son being two so he's obviously married allison um she's had a baby she's had a boy it's his second naming day so there's a big feast and there's a big hunt's gonna go on but it's just explained by what's going on we don't need someone standing yet you know explaining every nuance to us because we're too stupid to figure it out kind of thing um, but in the opening scenes, we see that the sort of um, the war in the Stepstones has started with uh, Damon and Lord Valerian against the Crab Feeder, which obviously was a sort of closing of last week with them forming an alliance and kind of going against the king. So this war started without the king's permission. And we basically sort of see that this war is not not going well. Um, and I said, then we go to the, the kingdom and we find out that the king's got a, got a son and Alice, Alison is very heavily pregnant, expecting her second child. Um, and it's, it's there's a um, Aegon, who's his son, in second naming day. Um, and he's basically trying to enjoy the naming day and he just wants to be with his family. Um, and he's constantly sort of being hassled and politicked, as he, as he calls it. And he just sort of very dismissive. He doesn't want to talk about the war. He doesn't want to talk about what's going on. He just wants to enjoy the day. Um, so as a family, they uh, all go to the king's woods for this hunt. Um, hit the princess. Um, goes kind of begrudgingly. Her nose is still very much out of joint um, since the king obviously remarried her, her best friend. Um and now the king's got a son. She's kind of you know, convinced herself, and obviously everybody in the kingdom's saying it, that the son's going to replace her as the heir. The king's going to name the son as the heir. So 
she's just feeling um, completely neglected. There's, and she makes, she says a line that, well, no one's here for me. You know, so she's she's really out of sorts. And, you know, she's been quite petulant. But I think, you know, she is behaving like a, like a teenager, which which she is. You know, she's been a very difficult teenager who's acting out against her father. She's hurt. And she feels she feels pushed out by his new wife and, and, and children. So the behavior all, all kind of kind of fits. Um, so we um, we get to the hunt and um, it basically sort of transpires though the, the king is trying to find or wants to obviously she's a the princess of marrying age Ramira and um, he sort of set up a meeting between her and Jason Lannister which uh, goes down really badly. <laughs> she finds him completely arrogant and really doesn't want to bar of it. And she sort of doesn't appreciate her father trying to marry her off. Um, there's a bit of a set to between her and her father in front of everybody, sort of basically saying, you know, he's completely arrogant and prideful. And he's like, well, that makes you a good match then, doesn't it? And basically, sort of, I think Otter has to step in and kind of go, <clears throat> you know, you can't be having this conversation in front of all the subjects and stuff. So she, she kind of storms off um, and gets on her horse um, and uh, rides off uh, into the woods. And Sir Kristen Cole, the knight, uh, follows her uh, to, make, to make sure she's OK. Um, once they've kind of left, the, the king is there and he's asking for wine. And he basically drinks a lot on this day. It, it, it looks like you know he's in a lot of pain so we don't know you know what's wrong whether he's ill at this stage but he's he's drinking a lot otto comes over and starts talking about the heir and replacing the princess with his grandson and again the, the king gets really annoyed just saying like to get said stop politicking stop going on about this i don't i don't want to talk about it um and otto basically suggests that she marries her brother um, to which the king is very dismissive of, you know, he, at the end of the day, he loves his daughter and he, he actually wants her to be looked after and protected. Um, and, you know, she needs a king consort. So he, he, he dismiss, dismisses that and he basically continues to get annoyed. Um, uh, one of his other advisors, um, Lord Strong, um, comes over, he's talking to him and he goes, oh, I suppose you want to talk to me about it as well. And he goes, well, do, do you want my advice? And he was like, King's like, whatever. By which point, you know, he's drinking more and more wine. And Lord Strong suggests that she marries Lord uh, Valerian's son. Um, uh, oh God, uh, Lainor, I think it's pronounced, Lainor, um, who's currently fighting in the Stepstones with his father and his uncle. So he was sort of saying, like, if he survives the, the war, that, that would be, again, that would align the houses, which was the original sort of point in the previous episode. But obviously the king opted to marry uh, Alison rather than uh, the other daughter. Um, so we basically we sort of see a bit where the... Uh, the knight catches up with the princess and sort of reigns her in and there's that sort of talking and they're getting to know each other and... Uh, she basically says she doesn't want to go back to the camp and she's sort of explaining, you know, how she's sort of just uh, feeling uh, sort of a bit dejected and that she's just going to, she has no purpose and all these kind of things. Um, and so she wants to stay out in the forest and that's basically, they end up staying out in the forest overnight. Um, and the king at this point is now, is sort of late getting into the evening. He's very drunk and he's out uh, by sort of bonfire and Alison comes to talk to him and sort of says, you know, what's wrong? Um, and he's like quite upset and distraught and basically says he, he years ago he sort of had this dream or a vision that he would have a son um a son Aegon and he'd have the crown um and the throne and he said this obsession to make this this vision happen basically is what got his first wife killed you know that the trying for another heir trying for a son so he's carrying all this guilt that he believes it's his fault that his wife died trying to give him an heir. Um, and then he's having a bit of a wobble whether he's picked, you know, whether he's done the right thing um, with his daughter being named heir, given like how she's behaving, because she, she, she's sort of been acting out. Um, and the whole point is he sort of picked her to protect the realm from 
Damon, but now she's just going to be as petulant and as disobedient as Damon. So he's like, he really doesn't know. Um, and she just kind of comforts him. And we kind of go back to sort of the, the princess um, and um, Cole, and they sit by the fire and they're talking, and then they hear some noise. And a wild boar tanks it out of the, out the forest and attacks them. Um, Cole's able to sort of stab it, but it hits the princess and she's down and she manages to hold it off. This bit's a little bit like, uh, I mean, these, these things got a tuss and they weigh a ton and really she should have been sort of gorged or injured at least. And But, but she manages to like fight it off and then she stabs it and kills it. So there's a little bit of, you know, suspended disbelief there. But overall, the, you know, the, the, the scene works. Um, and then the next day, the, the king's out on a hunt um, and they're looking for this white stag and this white stag is sort of like to do like an omen kind of thing and they're trying to find the white stag. They don't find the white stag, but they find just a normal stag. Um, <laughs> and the king hunting means somebody else catches the stag and it's tied up and he just comes over and has to stab it and he stabs it and misses the heart. So then he has to stab it again. So there's a little bit like murmurings amongst the men. But they manage to kill the stag and they go back to camp. And then the princess um, comes back with Cole and they basically uh, have the boar with them. But before coming back to camp, they actually see the white stag. And again, it's supposed to be like sort of like an omen kind of thing. It's like, you know, who's going to rule? Um, and, and Cole goes to kill it and she stops him. So we've kind of had this prophetic thing. And then she comes in covered in blood. Her hair's all like red, so it's covered in blood. Um, and there's sort of a few raised eyebrows from the, the the men of the camp, like Poof, check her out. You know, she's she's caught a, caught a boar by herself and, and a knight kind of thing. Um, we then um, then sort of go goes on to them all sort of back at the kingdom um, and in the evening. Um, Otto goes to his daughter and is basically trying to trying to manipulate her into speaking to the king about making her son heir so he's not given up on this yet and she sort of listens to him and obviously she's sort of heavily pregnant so she's like not feeling the best and I think she's a bit fed up with it as well and sort of being a bit of a pawn between her father and, and the king because she generally seems to love the king um, or have some sort of affection for him so anyway, she does go see the king and she says can we talk and he's oh let me guess about uh, Ramira um, and actually rather than talking about um who's in line she actually sort of brings up about Ramira marrying and he's like yeah it didn't go well with Jason and she was like well what did you expect you know sort of saying you know, she's quite a headstrong girl um and the king just explains like he wants what's best for her and so his duty you know he, he she knows his duty she, she's got to marry he's had to marry she's a bit like you know just get over it <laughs> so her advice to him is basically she will marry um but she just needs to believe it's it's her choice to do to do so so i think that kind of you know registers with the with the king um and then she sees a note on the table and she's like may i read it and he's like yes and it's a it's a note from um uh, the stepstones um i think one of the the lords has sent it obviously not damon um basically saying it's not going well and they need help so again she kind of persuades the king to to help damon um, and then we kind of go to the next day and we see the king talking to Ramira um, and basically he reassures her that he's not, not going to replace her as the heir um, and she's quite taken aback by this and um, they have quite a frank talk and she's like, no, stop, stop trying to set me up with people and, um, and again he explains to her that he says that I'm not going to be, I, I'm not going to be alive forever and I need to know that you're going to be OK, that, that you're with someone who's going to protect you, will make sure you're OK and strengthen the throne. And she kind of was OK. Um, and he sort of starts about duty and about and she kind of throws back at him. Oh, well, like so like, how he didn't marry for duty because he didn't marry Lord Venera's daughter. Um, Valerian's daughter. <laughs> he married Alison. And he's like, mm, fair one, you know, and. Uh, but he just sort of says, look, you know, I, I, you know, I want you to be happy. I, I was lucky enough to have loved your mother, and he loves Alice, and he just wants her to be happy. So, it's kind of been left that she can find her own um, husband 
to a degree, I guess. But and for the first time you see her smile, she smiles up at the king. So there's almost like a bit of a truce going on between them that he sort of said, and he, he's honest with her. He does say, I did have a wobble and think about, you know, um, renaming my heir, but I picked you for a reason. Um, so hope this is sort of the first sort of bit of a bridge to them, you know, hopefully repairing their relationship. But <laughs> we'll, we know what these shows are like, so we'll wait and see on um, Sunday whether that's the case. So then basically we go back to the Stepstones. Um, it uh, comes to light. So we've got the, the, the Lords, um, uh, uh, Lord um, Valerion, his brother, and his son, and sort of generals are all over the map, and they're basically saying, you know, explaining that the war's not going well, they can't get to the troops because every time they try and attack the, the crab feeders troops, they um, retreat into the caves and they just bed themselves in in the caves and they can't get to them. So basically, we need a plan that we can have someone as bait to draw them out of the caves. And then if we can get them out far enough, then basically we can then go in with the dragons and the archers and, and take everybody out. But then there's an argument because saying well, that means sacrificing someone. Someone's got to be the bait and the basic suicide mission. So this we see like uh, Damon fly back um, and he comes to the table and he uh, and a messenger arrives and hands Damon a note, um, which is the one from the king. And there's kind of a voice over the, the king reading out the note where he's basically um, saying, I hear things aren't going well. I'm sending boats and ships and such and such. Um, whereas when there was a, a line when the king was talking to um, Ramira, basically saying, you know, Damon would rather die than accept help from me um, when he was explaining about the note and no, it came from, you know, um, not, not from Damon. Um, so Damon sort of hears it or reads this note, <laughs> loses his shit, basically, picks up the helmet and starts beating the crap out of the messenger that brought, brought the note. He's like absolutely pummeling him and they sort of pull him off, this messenger. Um and next thing we see is like Damon rowing out to the crab feeders. Like, so basically, he's heard this plan. Um, he's prepared to be the bait. He's prepared to die carrying out this plan. Because, like, as his brother said, the king said, Damon would rather die than have my help. So he's rowing out. And this is the most amazing scene. So basically, Matt, uh, Matt Smith has come on, come on. And the, this whole thing lasts about 10 minutes. And he does not say a single word of dialogue, not one word. And it's phenomenal. Matt Smith's acting and what he conveys, this sort of hatred or, you know, it's no by the look on his face that he's going for broke. So if I die winning the war, I've won. If I die losing the war, I've won because my brother won't have been able to help me. So he rose out. To this crab feeders island he starts acting out the plan he goes he goes up towards the caves he's basically waving a white flag like he's surrendering he gets there he takes out his sword he's holding his sword up with the white flag um one of the uh, crab feeder men comes out and comes up to to damon goes to take the sword and then obviously damon just chucks the flag sword stabs him and obviously there's just a barrage and then of, of the crab feeder men coming towards him and then all hell breaks loose. <laughs> so he's fighting all these troops and he's just going, I mean, he's just like, you know, like a berserker. He's just going for it and he's running through and there's a barrage of arrows. Um, and uh, again, it's a little bit of, you know, disbelief that, you know, he's dodging all these arrows, but he does get hit, I think, in the leg and then kind of um, in the side. But his armor obviously takes a lot of it. Um, and he's, he's down at one point. Um, but then as he's down, it starts drawing out all the troops from the caves as per the plan. And then when he's pretty much surrounded, his troops then all come in and then the, the fight all kicks off. Um, and this is with, with all of them out and exposed then. Um, the, uh, Le, oh, I can't say his name. <laughs> Um, Laneron uh, Valerian, the Lord's son, um, flies in on the dragon and basically incinerates the archers. Everybody, like, just like they're, they're up on a ravine and it just flies down, incinerates all these archers. And it's just hacking and maiming. 
And then you basically see the crab feeder going back into the cave and Damon clocks this and you just see him tanking after the, the guy, the crab feeder, and there's the battles going on. And then basically you can kind of see like the dragon taking them out and the fighting that they're pretty much winning the battle. And then right at the end, uh, Damon comes out and he's like holding like an arm. So he's basically carrying this torso and he is just smothered in blood, like head to toe in blood, dragging the, the crab feeder, feeder's torso behind him. And that's pretty much, you know, they've, they've, they've won the war of the Stepstones. And I think that that's pretty much where it ends. So, yeah, a great episode. Lots happening. Um, the story's all moving forward. Again, they're sort of doing these time jumps. So we're not seeing lots of, you know, um, we didn't like have to see the king get married or anything like that. You know, it's, it's just happened. Things are moving on. So, yeah, I love this episode and this bit, like 10 minutes that, you know, from the moment Matt Smith walks on screen to the moment it ends, he does not say a single word. Phenomenal piece of acting. Uh, just a, um, And Paddy Constantine in this, who plays the king, very much, you know, great. He was so good in this episode. You know, he's really, you really get into grips with the king's character and what's important to him. And family is massively important to him, uh, almost more over duty. Um, and you can just sort of, you know, and Otto, who, who initially seemed to be like his right hand man, he's sort of someone he could trust, is actually becoming more and more manipulative each episode, um, sort of teeing up that at some point, you know, he's going to literally, <laughs> or, <laughs> or, you know, metaphorically stab the king in the back because obviously he wants his, his grandson on the throne. So, definitely heating up really looking forward to episode four um can't wait to see what happens i just really really hope this quality continues through through to the end of the season and and onwards because so far they're, they're knocking out the park now they've really sorted out their pacing issues loving it so do check out house of the dragon as I said, if this is your first time watching this, I am a complete normie when it comes to House of the Dragon. I've never watched Game of Thrones. So you can really just jump into this with no knowledge of the, the books or the, the shows that have come before. If anything, it probably helps you because you don't have the baggage of uh, the infamous season seven, eight of, of Game of Thrones. So I'm just obviously face value enjoying it. So do go check it out. It's on Sky in the UK. We kind of get it. Monday mornings and obviously on HBO on a Sunday in the States. So the other thing, obviously the big thing that came out um, this weekend or Friday was Cobra Kai season five. Now, because it's only just come out, it's going to be sort of spoiler free. I think I'm going to do a separate video talking about season five as a whole um, and telling you which will have spoilers in it. But I just really, just really want to uh, say, as you can tell, for my demeanor <laughs> good news season five was brilliant i absolutely loved season five so you know with these shows we all sit there with bated breath when the next season comes out just going please don't have ballsed it up please don't have gone woke you know all those kind of things that we dread when something sort of becomes popular and the, the studios get their hands on it really pleased to report none of that nonsense the thing the show does so well is character development. Every season, the characters move on, they've evolved, their relationships changed. You know, the Johnny we're seeing in season five isn't the Johnny we saw in season one. Same with like Daniel and same with the kids as well. They're not just sort of trying to keep them at a certain age and behaving at a certain age. Everybody is evolving as this show goes on. Each season, they bring in a new, oh, sorry, a new old... <laughs> previous character from the films um the um i think it's it's not a spoiler to say because it was out there but we get mike barnes in this one but you will have to see whether he's a good or a bad guy i'm not going to say but we get mike barnes and we get um danny's girlfriend from karate kid part three um so she she knows terry silver and mike barnes and she's actually his wife's cousin in this this, this show so again, nice little cameo of her coming back. And she sort of explains a bit more about the relationship 
or the, the history with um, Daniel and uh, Terry Silver to help her sister understand a bit more why, why Daniel's so uptight about all of this. Um, yeah, so, the, so yeah, the story absolutely moves on. There's a great bit really sort of saying between how Johnny's character is changing and maturing and how Daniel's on a, a difficult path because of Terry and what happened in the previous season. There's almost like a bit of role reversal going on. So I'm not gonna say any more than that because let's say I promise no spoilers, but it's really, really well written. Again, the story all makes sense. The plot continues. There's not massive great plot holes anywhere. It's fun. Um, there's still enough that sort of, sort of um, I wanna say darkness to it because I say quite it's dark, but you've still got those serious moments in there um with this you know with the with the the, the interrelationships really and the backstory and the, and the baggage and the heritage that comes with all these characters um which they explore a bit more about crease and when he was younger um and how he's kind of ended up where where he is because obviously he's in prison at the, at the end of the last season um and again his sort of relationship with silver and what really where his character is going to go so uh yeah so basically watched it over two days i mean that's my only complaint is that obviously these these shows i mean they're not, they used to be half an hour i think they're about 40 minutes now but we only get like 10 episodes um <laughs> and there's sometimes where you love having the binge model and then you hate having the binge model because now i've watched it and it's gonna be another year before we get another season but uh but yeah i absolutely loved season five i think they knocked it out the park it's easily as good as season one in my opinion i think what they have really got to grips with is the balance between the kids storylines and the adult storylines i think um two and three was probably a bit more kid heavy and they I think they were still massively successful and popular but they weren't as popular as season one and i really do think they've got that dynamic and the the storyline balance right now um because that's what really worked in season four as well so yeah they've absolutely nailed that um sort of seeing the kid dynamic and the adult dynamics and how all that works so yeah do go check out cobra kai season five and if you haven't seen cobra kai where have you been <laughs> um go go check it out all five seasons are on netflix um you you don't have to have seen the karate kid films to to get into this show the first season it does explain the characters there's lots of flashbacks that basically kind of explain the dynamic and what, what happened in the films obviously if you want i would say it's a benefit if you do watch the films before watching the tv show but it's not essential it may be that if you watch the first season it might make you want to go back and watch the the three films um uh, yeah, it's it's just the perfect blend of nostalgia, but moving the story forward, moving the characters forward. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of reboots and re remakes because they've just been so atrocious over the last few years and just managed to crap over all our childhood and eighties memories. This is the one show that's got it absolutely bang on. It's absolutely spot on. Just the right level of nostalgia right right say right amount of flashbacks there's not lo it's not loads of heavy let's watch this whole chunk from this film but it's just enough to to clue people in who maybe haven't seen the films or you know ha you know, ha haven't seen them for years like myself or maybe you know you haven't seen them since they came out in the 80s but it's just enough to trigger your memory and go oh i remember that character so um yeah do do go check it out great mix of like humor and, and say some serious storylines in there um, it's just it's just so much fun. So um, yeah, it's been great. So apart from <laughs> She-Hulk, having two great shows to watch this week. Um, yeah, absolutely buzzing of, on the back of watching these. Um, yeah, so that that's it for this week. Um, unfortunately, I will have to watch She-Hulk next week. Yay! But at least I've got the House of the Dragon to rinse that bad taste out of my mouth. Um, uh, obviously, as I said last week, I think we've got Andor coming up. What was quite interesting with Andor, actually, um, on I haven't really looked at much on the sort of uh, Disney day, the Disney Plus day, because um, I'm not a massive fan of Disney Plus, and as you might have gathered from the, these uh, these um, weekly roundups of like the the MCU and uh, the Star Wars stuff. 
Um, but what I found really interesting is they've done a, a sort of 10 minute special on Andor. Um, so a bit behind the scenes, a bit about the show, interviewing the, the lead actor who plays Andor, and I think that the guy that's really in it. Um, and what I was really surprised about was that they were actually telling you about the show. <laughs> who knew? Um, a bit about the story, um, a bit about the character, sort of where we are, where we're picking up from, where it fits in with Rogue One. And they were showing you some scenes with Stellan Starsgard and, and Andor um, and kind of Andor's character and what he's about and why he's there. Because everything we'd seen up to this point, as I said previously, I was quite looking forward to this show. And then the showrunners and the actors all started opening their mouths, talking about women in the Empire and inclusion and diversity and blah, 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 blah. And I kind of like, oh, God, here we go again. I kind of lost interest. So I found it really surprising um, to, to find this little snippet on, on Disney Plus actually talking about the show. Um, and a lot of it seems to be in filmed um, on location. So it's not all in the uh, volume, you know, so it's not all on green screen, which I think, you know, the Mandalorian suffers from that. You can often see that it's on the, on the you know, they're not really in the desert or anything like that. So this seems to be much darker, much grittier kind of, color palette if you like um for this show um but it's i say it's actually on on location um and it may be a little bit more hopeful that it, it may not have all the politic nonsense that the some of the cast are promoting because we have seen how house of the dragon was marketed that it was gonna be all down with the patriarchy and it was all gonna be you know go go women and you know we've really not seen that in in house of the dragon so far and there's been a couple of other shows as well i mean even even like prey has obviously very mixed reviews and some people think it's incredibly woke some people like self i don't think it's that woke but you know there's my rolling moments in there but it was nowhere near as bad as i thought it was going to be based on how they'd marketed it so again only time will tell it might end up being exactly what we're expecting it to be especially being Disney Plus, it could be all those things that we're dreading or actually maybe someone's waking up to like, you know, keep get, get your cast to keep their mouth shut and actually market the show about what it's about and actually tell people what the show is about. Not your opening gambit is it's about diversity and inclusion because that's not a story. That's just, that's just a, you know, a statement of fact, maybe it's got nothing to do with what the show's about. So, um, yeah, I mean, go, go, if you have Disney Plus, um, I think it's got Andor behind the scenes special. It's literally only 10 minutes. I'd say go take a look if you're vaguely interested. Um, but it did actually sort of make me go, OK, maybe I'll give the first episode a go. So I think I will will certainly watch the first. I think I think I said last week I'll watch the first couple of episodes, see what Andor's about. But it was refreshing to see something from Disney that actually, you know, was was about the show and just not about virtue signaling and ticking boxes. So watch this space, I guess. Yeah, so I think that's it, really. Um, I will be here next week suffering for you. <laughs> um, but do take care. Have a good week. It has obviously been a bit of a difficult week in the UK this week um, with, the, with the passing of the Queen. It's a bit of a strange one. Um, you could see all the bottom feeders have come out on Twitter, uh, which is a bit of a shame. You know, I'm I'm not a royalist, um, but, you know, I have respect for, for the Queen um, and, you know, for someone who, who served their whole life for this country. And, you know, it's just a shame that um, I do think in situations like this, you know, if you haven't got something nice to say, just don't don't say it. At the end of the day, you know, it's a human being. It's a person that's passed away. And there's a family grieving. Now, whether you loathe and detest that family because of their status, their money, that's that's your prerogative. But they are human beings. And I think people just forget that. Twitter certainly forgets that. So anyway, I don't want to <laughs> end up on a sad note. But um, yeah, strange week this week. And it's going to be a bit strange in the UK until after her funeral. Um, yeah. You know, these things can bring out the best and worst of people. And I think we've seen a bit of both. 
but anyway and also uh when i'll be putting this out it will be um september 11th or 9 11 so um thoughts with any american viewers um i, I know you know the world you know it's been, been a long time but for those people who lost people it might as well have been yesterday so thoughts with you as well tough Tough, tough week for, for both sides of the pond. Anyway, like I said, that's it. So I turned on a bit of a bum note, but uh, just just wanted to say something and, it, and acknowledge the Queen. So um, there we go. Anywho, okay, I will see you next week <laughs> where I will be suffering through She-Hulk. Have a good week. Bye-bye.